The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Inviting you to leave behind you the humdrum everyday world and explore the unusual, the strange, and the weird. The experiences we encounter here happen to persons just like us. One of you, I'm certain, has seen a flying saucer. Another has had an extrasensory perception. Haven't you seen a ghost or an apparition? Don't take the question lightly. Some things happen that cannot be explained. Listen to the doubt in Claire Porter's voice as she says to her husband. It makes no sense, Tom. You dreamed it. And I don't know why you've never gotten over the robbery of First Federal. Golly, you have to forget it. You were questioned and freed. And lost my job. This is retribution. Look at all this money. Old John Sutter sent it to me. Impossible. He's been dead for years, Tom. Then you explain where the money came from. Our mystery story, The Fabulous Pillow, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. proverb that goes, the mills of the gods grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. What that means, of course, is that justice may be postponed, but seldom is it denied. What's cruel about injustice is the suffering a person endures from false accusation. Once accused, he is tainted, even though innocent of the charges made against him. And that, as we will hear, is a burden that Tom Porter has borne for many years. He and his wife, Claire, are driving home from a dinner party at a friend's home in the country outside Hartford. Did you have a good time, Claire? Oh, yes. What a beautiful estate. Nice people, good food. Rich, rich, rich. Mike has done very well at the bank. What's his salary? Any idea? Plenty. He's a vice president now. He runs their investments. If I still work there... <laughs> Big word. Water over the dam, darling. Yeah, but some of it spilled on me. We are doing all right. If you think so, I'm content. But I did have a rosy future planned for us. Money isn't everything. <laughs> you tell them. I mean it. Well, then you're not only pretty, you're silly. <laughs> pretty silly. <laughs> Who wouldn't like to have Mike's money? I would. Instead, we're always squeezing just to meet the bills. You have the summers off, Tom. Yeah, but on a teacher's salary, where can we afford to go? Assuming you give up your job. No, 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 no. It's subsistence, baby. It's not living. You still think the security guard was innocent? What was, what was his name? Uh, I don't remember right off. Uh, um, yeah, I thought so all the time. He liked me as much as he hated Whitfield, the assistant manager of First Federal. <laughs> Now, stuffed shirt Whitfield is president. Why did you testify for the guard? I told you, Claire. I, I thought he was a good guy. Hey, what you're driving? Sorry, sorry. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Who's a judge of character? If the old guard was mixed up in the heist, I'd never have guessed it. He was a kind of grandfather figure, you know. White hair and his eyes twinkled, proud of the bank. It just didn't figure. Well, forget it. It's easier said than done, darling. The police investigation splashed first federal and me all over the newspaper. But you were pronounced innocent. That's no good. In the minds of the banking community, I'm still associated with the crime. End of banking career. Tom, look out! Oh, no, 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 no. Too late! Come on, Tom? Tom? Oh, he's bleeding. He's unconscious. Lock 
Excuse me, sir. My car battery went dead. Oh, and I... Come in, young man. Come in. Thank you. May I use your telephone to call some garage? I don't have a telephone. Oh. Well, I, I'd better try another house. Yeah, closest one's a mile down the road. A mile? I, uh, I don't know what to do. My, my wife... She's all right? Oh, yes. I, I told her to lock up the car. Where am I? Martinsville. Nothing's open this late at night. State police might come along. If they don't, the two of you are welcome to stay with me and Amy. She's gone up to bed, but she said to expect you. She... She did. I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> you, you don't recognize me, do you, son? No, I can't say that I do. Well, the hair's gone on top, and I grew this mustache and beard. Look close. There's something familiar about you, Miss Sutter. Sutter? John Sutter? Yeah, the same. The man you stood by after the Hartford heist. We never forgot Amy and me. The Hartford heist. That's what they called it. Ten years ago. Well, I'm glad you're both alive, John. What have you been doing with yourself all these years? Well, the bank pensioned me off, and Amy's made a good thing of her needlepoint and quilt making. Look around you. Yes, I, I've been admiring them. Then, of course, uh, there was the money. Oh, the boys made off with half a million, Tom. Yes, I know. The police recovered most of it. Yeah, I read about it. Two of the gang were killed in a shootout. The third, as I recall, tried to involve you. Yes, yeah, he did. And the police pounced on me like a blue jay on a June bug. <laughs> they couldn't prove a thing. 90,000 was still missing. A lot of money. About 60 is left, Tom. 60? Left where? Well, son, this will come as a shock to you, but I wasn't as innocent as you thought. You were in on the hunt? Yeah. And, and you have the money that's still missing? Oh, but about 30 grand. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Why are you telling this to me? You want to hear how I masterminded the robbery? No. I feel bad enough having been a character witness. Then I feel worse because that cost you your job. I was innocent. You were not. True enough. Well, Amy and I talked it over. You were hurt bad, and we want you to have the money that's left. About 60 grand. And the money belongs to First oh, Federal. Oh, forget the bank. The money that was stolen was recovered, and what wasn't was covered by insurance. Still, it's their money. Two men were shot down, Tom. Well, they should have been. Will you listen to my proposal? I won't touch the money. You lost your career. If you hadn't, maybe today you'd be the vice president in charge of investments. Instead, you're teaching high school mathematics. Will you listen to my proposal? Go ahead. I want you to invest the money in your name and pay the interest to me. When Amy and I die, the principal is yours. You won't have long to wait. I'm 76, Tom. It's dirty money. I'm not. I've never taken a dishonest oh, dollar. It's compensation for a busted career. Think of it that way. Where is the money hidden? You'll receive it in good time. Right now is where nobody can find it. And the police have been through our things with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> Think it over. The money's yours. Do with it what you please. A police? No, an ambulance. <laughs> Remember our talk, Tom. They'll have your husband out of there in minutes, Mrs. Porter, and uh, don't worry, he's all right. I still don't know what really happened, officer. Oh, car skidded. Went off the road. Your husband was sober, wasn't he? Oh, yes. I thought he was dead. Concussion. I'm no doctor, but uh, that's my guess. He cracked his head against the steering wheel or the windshield. Uh, He'll be all right. He said the... Battery went dead. What? I was to lock myself in the car and he'd go for help. Your husband said that? And then he slumped and passed out. Well, I guess his mind was wandering. Uh, yeah. Uh, what? Oh. Yeah, it's Oh. Get over there. Hi. 
Uh, can you help me start my car, officer? Tom, the car's a wreck. How are you? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't un- understand. You uh, ran off the road and cracked up, Mr. Porter. I, I did? Right. Yes, uh... I'd better give the ambulance for the hand. We're taking you to the hospital. Uh, what for? Yeah. I heard the siren when I was talking to John Sutter up at the farmhouse. Yeah. The car battery... Tom, there was nothing wrong with the battery. We went oh, off the road. Now, you're talking funny. A concussion can do that. But I I was in his farmhouse, and uh, we, 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 we talked about the robbery at first federal. Tom, you imagined it. You've been here all the time. I was frantic. And then Lieutenant Hogan came by and ordered an ambulance. It's here now. Now, take it easy. Uh, you can bring me a stretcher closer, boy. Yeah, all right. He just got knocked on the head. Yeah, right, sir. Well, I, I feel faint. Well, that's all right. I'll get you to the hospital in no time. You're going to be all right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll drive you to the hospital, Mrs. Porter. You know, you were lucky, both of you. How did it happen? Oh, it was my fault. I got to talking about something that happened years ago, and it must have distracted Tom. man's name. Sutter? Who's Sutter? The security guard who was arrested after the first federal bank was robbed back in 1969. Remember that? Oh, uh, vaguely. But, uh, how does, uh, this Sutter come into this? Say, you, you sure you're all right? John said he went up to the farmhouse on the hill and had a talk with John Sutter. Well, now, you know better than that, Mrs. Porter. You said he never left the car. He didn't. He couldn't, but... Why should he talk about Sutter and the robbery? He got me. Your husband's wussy from the crack on his head. Uh, There was a farmhouse up there, but uh, five years ago it burned down. And Mr. Sutter? Well, as far as we know, Sutter and his wife died in the fire. They died in their farmhouse when it burned down? That's what the medical examiner said. Darling, don't brood about it. We're alive, luckily. It's not that, Claire. I'm thinking about Sutter and his wife, Amy, and a comfortable living room filled with needlepoint pillows and beautiful quilts. Tom, you imagined all that. Believe me, you were unconscious. You never left the car. It was tilted half on its side. Yes, but I talked with him, Claire. Really, I did. Concussion can do that. The doctor said you had a concussion. Consciousness returns slowly. Now, please, lie back and rest. It's the only cure, Tom. Now, I have to see Lieutenant Hogan and fill out some forms. That should do it, Mrs. Porter. Can I give you a ride into Hartford? Oh, no, thank you, Lieutenant. I'll spend the night with Tom. Is he asleep now? I hope so. Was he uh, still muttering about the Sutter and the uh, robbery? Uh, yes, he was. Why is he so hipped on Sutter and that old robbery? Well, Tom worked at the bank at the time. Oh, I see. He was a witness for Sutter's defense, kind of a character witness. Sutter was freed. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember that vaguely, too. The bank didn't like Tom testifying, so he was eased out. Why? Oh, guilt by association. Hmm. Well, that's not justice. And now this, huh? Well, he's still dwelling on the injustice. The accident brought it all out. Now he's fantasizing about visiting with the dead man. Ah. I'm sorry for him. Well, somehow he'll have to put it behind him. If he doesn't, he could go over the edge. Have you ever brooded over a wrong done to you? Of course you have. Has it ever been righted? No? Sometimes? Well, here we have a young man whose banking career was terminated because he testified for the defense of a robbery suspect. Although innocent himself, he still suffers from guilt by association. And I ask you, a conversation with a dead man? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. We live in a time when individualism is more important than ever before. Individualism is the worship of self. To reach our goals, we lose our sense of responsibility to others. That's why Tom Porter was forced out of his banking career. The image of the bank was more important than Tom's belief that John Sutter was an innocent man. Well, he's found out differently. It's still on his mind, 
as he is about to leave the hospital. Hey. Mm. hey wake up, wife. Oh. Oh. I can hardly move. I told you to go home. Uh, what, and leave you here dying? Oh, I'm fine. Let's get out of here. Oh, that chair with no place to fall asleep. Oh, Tom. You talked pretty crazy last night. No, I didn't, darling. I know what happened to me. I'm not talking about the accident. I mean about John Sutter. Tom, dear Tom, darling Tom, for the last time, will you please forget John Sutter? His farmhouse burned down and he's dead. Years ago. Lieutenant Hogan said so. But I talked with Sutter. Sure you did. Darling, you had a concussion. You were knocked out. Your mind wandered around because you can't forget what happened ten years ago. You know what he said? Uh, he was the inside man who worked with the gang that robbed the bank. Which makes you some great judge of character. Yeah, yeah, that hurts. Well, that's ancient history. Sutter knew what happened to me, so he wants to compensate me for losing my job. Uh-huh. He still has $60,000. He wants me to invest it and pay him the interest. When he and his wife Amy die, the principal will be ours. Tom, it's a pipe dream. That's what he said. Tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to prove you're crazy. I will telephone for a rented car. This time I'll do the driving. We'll return to where we had the accident and you'll see for yourself that you are wrong. Look at that car. You admit that a dead battery didn't do that. We weren't going fast, Claire. Fast enough to plow up the side of the culvert and smash the fence. It's hard to believe. When you pulled left, the car half overturned, you hanging in the driver's seat, me lying against the right-hand door. I could hardly get out. Have you seen enough? Yep. Well, now for the farmhouse. Oh, how far? I don't remember. Not far. I saw a light in the house and uh, wrapped and... John Sutter, let me in. Uh huh. All right. Well, look around. You see anything? There's a house way back there on that rise. No, no, no. That's a mile away. I didn't walk that far. Oh, I see something. Here, look. Yeah. It looks like the foundation of a cellar. Overgrown with weeds. No house. You're right. No house. Convinced? I have to be. I'd say so. No farmhouse, no John Sutter. Just you, spaced out. I give up. I did dream it, Claire. But it was so vivid. I can see the old man. And all those needlepoint pillows and quilts. Good evening, Mrs. Porter. Hello, Lieutenant. Am I uh, interrupting anything? Uh, no, no. Come in. I just took a chance. Uh, that's to... all right. Come in. Tom? Lieutenant Hogan? I'll be right there. Oh, please sit down. Thank you. It's a very nice room. I, uh, I didn't expect to see you again, but I'm glad you dropped in. I want to thank you for your help last night. Yes, and my thanks, too, Lieutenant. Oh, you're welcome. Just routine. Thank heaven you came along when you did. What can we do for you, Lieutenant? Well, this is an informal visit. You don't have to answer my questions if you don't want to, and maybe you won't because the subject's probably painful. Anyway, it's about the Hartford heist. Well, I'll answer anything you want to ask. Well, good. I'm no psychologist, but uh, what you said got me sort of interested, so I looked up the robbery in our files. Why? What's your interest? It's still, in part, an unsolved crime. $90,000 still has not been recovered. I'd like to trace it, maybe find it. Sutter has it. Tom. That's, uh... That's not what you said during the investigation, Mr. Porter. You defended Sutter as a man of good character, honest, conscientious. Your words. Well, at the time, I believed the words. I have since found out that I was wrong. Lousy judgment. I see. What changed your mind? Well, uh, Claire. When, when Tom was knocked unconscious by the accident, 
He dreamed that Sutter confessed being the inside man in the robbery. His share was $90,000. He spent about thirty dollars to supplement his pension and wants Tom to have the 60000 that's left to invest for Sutter until he dies. That's it. Do you believe all that, Mr. Porter? No. It was a fantasy. I, I know that now. Well, that's progress. Still, the money's gone. Let's assume that Sutter was the inside man in the bank. How did he work the holdup? And where would he have hidden the money? Don't know. Can you recall just what happened on the day of the robbery? Sure. Will you tell me? How many times? It's all right, honey. It's, it's okay. Let me see. I was uh, I was an assistant teller. Uh, from time to time, First Federal transferred cash to other banks in and around Hartford. Uh, I supervised the job. Sutter was head of security, armed, of course. So were the guards in the transfer truck. Now, you saw the truck and the guards? Oh, that's right. There were three of them, all armed. Sutter and I watched as the money was carted out. And when most of the money had been loaded into the truck, Sutter yelled, Tom, it's a holdup. He raised his gun and fired, but one of the truck guards slammed his arm with the butt of a shotgun. So, uh, Sutter gave the warning, then. Yes, that's right. And I ran back into the bank to ring for the police. When I got back, the guards were dragging Sutter into the truck. He shouted uh, something about the, the real guards being tied up in the truck, and uh, the, then the truck raced away. I see. And I swore at the time that Sutter was innocent. He yelled the warning, he fired his gun, and he was kidnapped. I, I thought he acted very bravely, and I said so. But it could have been staged. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, the robbers dumped Sutter blindfolded and his hands tied behind him about uh, five miles out of town. Uh, a little further on, the police found the armored truck. Where the robbers evidently changed to a private car. Yes. And uh, it was after this that you left the bank. Yeah, that's right. Whitfield suspected Sutter of complicity in the robbery, but he never said so. Mm-hmm. Now you teach school. Yes. After the robbery, no other bank was interested in my services, so I teach school. Of course, Whitfield, and it <laughs> kills me to admit it, was right. Sutter was part of the gang. Because he said so to you? Tom? Uh, I, I retract that, Lieutenant. Uh, that's something I dreamed. <laughs> Evening for callers. Oh, I'll see who it is. Mm. The package, Mr. Porter. Oh, thank you. The sign here? Where it's signed? Uh, oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you. A package for you, Tom. Huh? Did you order something? No. Who's it from? Mr. Gore. Oh, come on. Mm, let me see. Gordon Whitfield. Is it ticking? Hey, this is crazy. What would Whitfield be sending you, all your old inter-office memos? Well, let's find out. <laughs> I don't understand. What is it? It's uh, something in a bag. Oh, look at the pillow. Old Gordon must be in his dotage. His needle pointing his secret vice? It's pretty. Oh, there's a lovely design. Hey, wait a minute. Here. Hold the pillow, Claire. But it... Hey, there's something feels crinkly inside. It can't be. All right, now, don't fly off the handle, but... Remember... Remember my dream? Oh, now what? I said his living room was filled with needlepoint pillows and quilts. His wife, Amy, made and sold them. And Sutter said... Sutter said no one would ever guess where the money was hidden. I won't believe a word of it. Have you got a scissors handy? Uh, that fingernail scissors will do. Over on the end table. Here you are. I cut the thread. Oh, Tom, this is unreal. All of it. Now, let me... What's that, Mrs. Porter? Money. Old... Beautiful money. The 60 grand Sutter wants me to invest. Oh, it's incredible. You cannot have gone to Sutter's farmhouse because it's burned down. You cannot have talked with Sutter because he's dead. Now, those are facts. Yes, I agree, but this is a fact, too. 60,000 facts hidden in a needlepoint pillow. 
And look here. The needlepoint covering is initialed A.S. Amy Sutter. But how is this possible? If the pillow didn't come from Sutter, it was sent to us by Whitfield. Why? That's what I want to know. Sutter said it was compensation for me. Uh, could it be conscience money from Whitfield? He has no conscience. It's some kind of joke. Well, take a look. This is no joke. It's a fortune. Just look at it. Crime casts a long shadow. Its effects sometimes are felt years after the deed. But the effects of this one are very strange. There's usually an explanation for what happens, but Tom Porter's experience is unique. The bank robbery with which he was tainted, his automobile accident, his fantasy visit with the dead John Sutter, and now to receive $60,000 of the stolen money. We will learn more when I return with Act Three. Have you ever made a mistake in judgment? Of course you have. I have, I know. A Welsh proverb holds that experience is the fool's best teacher. The wise do not need it. In Tom Potter's case, substitute judgment for experience. He was mistaken about John Sutter, and his life was changed by it. Tom has just opened the box containing the pillow and the stolen money. Sutter is dead. How many times do you have to be told that, Tom? Well, then we're mixed up in something supernatural. There is no such thing. Anyway, there, there, there's some rational explanation for this. Sure. Sutter's alive. But he isn't. Will you trust me with the rented car? Where are you going? Back to the site of the accident. I, I'm going with you. No, ma'am. Why not? Only if you stay in the car and let me walk up that hill alone. And all you will find is a foundation overgrown with weeds. You saw that this morning. Yes, I did. But, but if I talked once with Sutter, maybe I can talk to him again. What do you say? Uh, all right. I owe it to the man, or to have it your way, to his ghost. And then what? Well, then I'll decide one way or the other. Agree with Sutter's request or call in Lieutenant Hogan. You really think there's something supernatural about this, Tom? Why not? Remember, you promised. I won't cheat unless you're gone too long. Lock the door after me. Tom, I'm scared. Relax, I'll be back soon. I don't believe I'm doing this. Returning to a ghost house, looking for a dead man, no one would believe it. No one should. But last night... Good Lord. There it is. The fauna. Light burning. Well, come in, son. John Sutter. There's something devilish about all this. Hey, Amy said you'd think so. Well, come in and sit down. Uh, I, I was here last night. That's right. But I was here earlier today, and there is no house. It burned down. And you're dead. That's right. Oh, I can't be right. What's the matter with me? Not a thing. But last night, I never left the car. Not physically, perhaps, but you were here. You remember what we agreed to? Not physically. What does that mean? Your spirit body was here. I don't believe it. You mean when I was knocked out, I stepped out of my skin and paid you a visit? Yeah. Well, well why would I find myself talking with you? Twice. I'm atoning for my sin against you. Uh-huh. And I suppose you know why I came back tonight. Oh, yes. Amy and I figured you would. You wondered what to do with the interest on the money you're going to invest. You bring it to me here. But if you're a ghost... I'll see that it finds its way into needy hands. Two years will do. Then I hope my wanderings will be at an end. And the principal will be yours. You know whose name was on the box containing the pillow? That was easy to arrange. I have a brother living in Hartford. He posted it. Oh, why was the center's name Gordon Whitfield? He has something to atone for on Earth, Tom. 
You understand? I don't believe any of it. Oh, yes. It's hard to accept. Man's mind is closed to everything except himself and what he can see and touch. Oh, don't let it bother you. Go along now. I'll see you later in the year. And that's what happened word for word. And now I'm really scared. I'm not, and don't you be, but it was weird. Not scary, just weird. Unless I've got a short circuit in my brain, I believe what I heard. But how... How could the brother have sent the pillow, and why under Whitfield's name? Did Sutter appear to his brother? Who knows? I suppose so. It's creepy thinking of ghosts hanging around waiting for atonement. Let's go home. Right. Well, what are you going to do? Keep the money? I want to talk to Hogan. He won't believe any of this. Oh, why don't we keep the money? I'm tempted, honey. I I really am. But look, let's talk again to Lieutenant Hogan. Lieutenant, what would you say if I told you that I know where 60,000 of the money can be found? I'd say, tell me. You're being mighty mysterious, Mr. Potter. Well, I've had a mysterious experience. All right, let me say officially that if you have the money, you're required by the law to return it. I like you and your wife, but if I have to, I'll get a search warrant. If the money's in your place here, we'll find it. All right. You do that, but I can tell you this. Assume I have the money, the police will... Would never lay their hands on it. Now, don't underestimate us. <laughs> you had the same opportunity ten years ago. You combed Sutter's house and didn't find the money. You can do the same here. We'll give it a shot. Thanks for coming over. I can uh, let myself out. Good night. You're in the soup, Tom. Yeah. If they find the money, what's the inference? That I was in cahoots with Sutter and the gang and got paid off. And you can't deny it because nobody would believe our story. I still say, let's fly the coop. It's too late. We're being watched. What? Of course. Ever since I began to babble about Sutter, Hogan's ears have been at point. He's got plain clothesmen following us. Oh, Tom, how dreadful. First first Sutter's ghost and now, now the police? I'll tell you one thing. We don't discuss the subject anymore. The apartment could be bugged. That's Whitfield, Claire. I'll go. Do you want me to stay? Of course. Hello, Mr. Whitfield. Just what is this about, may I ask? Come in. You'll find out. Uh, You've met Mrs. Porter? Good evening. Yes, I have. Please, won't you sit down? For a minute. I'm expected at the Century Club in 20 minutes. Will you please explain your mysterious telephone call? What if I told you that I know where to lay my hands on 60000 of the bank's missing $90,000? <laughs> Lieutenant Hogan suspected that you could. Well? I was wrong about Sutter. The prosecution thought so. He went free because of your stubborn insistence that he was innocent. I paid for it. Indirectly, Whitfield, you too seem to have been mixed up in the robbery. You'll excuse me? No, not yet. Uh, about $60,000 was sent to me. Meaning, obviously, that you, as well as Sutter, participated in the robbery. You waited a long time for your share of the money. I had nothing to do with the holdup. The stolen money was sent to me by you. You know that? Your return address was on the package containing it. You must have the receipt. True? Yes. I received a receipt in the mail. How do you explain it? I don't. I didn't send the package. If I turn over the package and the money to the police, uh, we'll make headlines, Whitfield. What do you want? The money? Freedom from prosecution? Is that your blackmail idea? I want justice. For ten years, I've been suspected of complicity in that robbery. No one in banking would offer me a job. You can correct that. How do you propose I correct it? If I turn the money over to you, I'd expect a statement from you to the press. Its content? Your gratification that for ten years, Tom Porter has searched for the money still missing from the robbery at First Federal and has found it. Mr. Porter, at last, 
is exonerated from any suspicion of having participated in it. His integrity cannot be questioned. I hope that he will be welcomed back to his interrupted career as a banker. Word it your own way. I've lived under this cloud of suspicion too long. The statement would be uncharacteristic of me and distasteful to the bank. Well, then I'll have to turn the package, including the wrapping, over to Lieutenant Hogan. If I issue such a statement, you'll destroy the wrapping with my name on it? Yes. My solemn oath. Very well. Good night. What a warm, friendly man he is. Tom, darling, what happens next? I send for Lieutenant Hogan. You know, I suppose, that this room was bugged. Everything you and Whitfield said was recorded. I figured it might be. Mr. Porter, you know where the money is, or you have it. I'm going to turn it over to you, Lieutenant, with certain conditions. I'm listening. The money was sent to me in a box, and the sender's name on the wrapping is Gordon Whitfield. I insist that Whitfield's name be kept out of this weird business. What else? A statement from you to the press that you and I have worked together long and hard to recover the money. Whitfield will support you. Then I'll be cleared, finally, of any suspicion. And you'll have a chance to return to banking. Yes. That's all I want. I'll have justice. Anything more? If there's a reward from the insurance company, I expect to receive it. For one thing, we need a new car. All right. I'd set the conditions. Where's the money? Uh, you're leaning on it, Lieutenant. What? The needlepoint pillow. What? It slid at the side. Reach inside and, uh, there you are. Oh, good Lord. This is the craziest. Well, let me get this straight. You said Sutter. Dead old John Sutter talked to you and told you you'd receive the money. Now, somehow you did receive it stuffed in a pillow and mailed to you by Whitfield who knows nothing about it? Correct. Those are the facts. That's absurd. Makes no sense. I know. But there's the money. We'll keep the pillow. <laughs> it's a nightmare. I agree. You explain it. Can you? An injustice was corrected, but realistically, the events are hard to explain. Perhaps, as the saying goes, wishing can make it so. Tom Porter lived for many years wishing that he could be free of the suspicion that he participated somehow in the big holdup. And John Sutter's conscience bothered him even after death because Tom suffered unfairly. Combine the two wills and wishes and a solution followed. Strange? Yes, indeed. I'll return shortly. stories I bring you, as I always say, are tales of the macabre. Unusual because in each of them there's a peculiar twist in a person's fate. The odd thing in the story we've just heard was Tom Porter's two encounters with the ghost of John Sutter. You may doubt it. If so, ask yourself how that stolen money came into his possession. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Terry Keene, Ralph Bell, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Them glassy blue eyes don't fool me. For oh, that pink skin, for oh, those red lips, or oh, those dandy clothes, neither. I know all about you, old man. All you need is one good push, and it's all over. Just one heck. The shove, that's all. Cassandra! Yes, Mr. Dryer? What were you doing? i I, I got to collect these glasses and wash them up. You were doing something else. Did you put your hands on it? Oh, the picture, you mean? You know that's what I mean. You told me not to. Well, did you? No, I was only talking to it. Why would... What? Talking to it? Do you like the picture? It ain't a question. Do I like it? I like to talk to it. One of these days, maybe he'll talk back. 
This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.